using young people to do important things for others, we have found to be life-changing. And you all, I guess, already know about the CERT training, which is going to be happening. And I thought it might be good for you all to have some history about how young people got started in the Southern Union doing disaster response. And so that's why I've entitled it, How It All Began for Us. And really it began, and I don't know if many high school students were really able to remember Hurricane Katrina. Any of y'all remember Hurricane Katrina 2005, high school students? Anybody live in New Orleans at that time or in Mississippi? Okay. Well, that's when it all began for us. August 25, 2005, 14 years ago. I had been in a position as secondary associate for two years, and this horrific storm comes through, and it basically destroyed Bass Memorial Academy. They were located 50 miles inland from the Gulf Coast. 105 mile an hour winds still at that location tore off all the roofs except for the two dorms, interestingly enough. So they had 80% of their school that had to be rebuilt. I felt like I needed to do something for that school, and so I told my boss, I said, Conrad, I need to go down and see what's going on at Bass and see how we can help out. And he said, do it. Go and see what you can do. Well, the Gulf States Conference asked me if I wouldn't get some young people together at some of our schools to go down and help Bass. So I said I would. Ended up having 60 young people that agreed to come down and help. But I thought, I need to go down and find out myself what's going on there before I bring a group of students in. I heard Adventist Community Services was there. I heard that ADRA was there, but neither one were there. And I will get to that in just a moment. But I want to introduce this a little bit by showing you what it looked like there on the Gulf Coast. Nothing left, mile after mile. Few trees. And a lot of times when that type of thing happens, it happened in New Orleans where they were flooded, and I will tell you a little more about the magnitude of what took place on the Gulf Coast. People ask, where is God when it hurts? And that's a valid question. I think Philip Yancey gave a pretty good description, I believe, of where God is when it hurts. And this is what he had to say. The church is God's presence on earth. Would you believe that? That's us, you and me. His body. And if the church does its job, if the church shows up at the scenes of disasters, visits the sick, staffs the aid clinics, counsels the rape victims, feeds the hungry, houses the homeless, I don't think the world will ask that question with the same urgency. They will know where God is when it hurts, in the bodies of His people ministering to a fallen world. Would you agree with that? There'll be no doubt. Because many times when we do what we do, people ask, who are you? Where are you from? Why do you do this? It doesn't make sense to the world out there why people would come on their own time and do this for nothing. So God's message to the world many times doesn't add up until they see it in action. And then they begin to understand what it's all about. Desire of Ages tells us what human power can do, divine power is not summoned to do. God could send his angels in there to do the muck outs, to do the debris removal, to run the pods and all those kind of things. But he lets us do it. 
He asks us to be a part of touching others. And the reason being, when I help you in a significant way, my life has changed. And I saw that at Hurricane Katrina in the lives of young people. This group was there, Acts. And you see all of that equipment. They came in immediately after the storm took place. Now imagine this. There is no power. There is no water. There's trees down everywhere. And I don't know if you've ever been to Bass Memorial Academy, but you don't go there by accident. You have to want to go there. It's down in the far reaches of the Southern Union. And so here comes this caravan. They really couldn't even get down the freeway, and so they came down a side road, interestingly enough. And they started cutting their way in because trees are all down along the road. And they have this caravan. There's probably 12 vehicles, 18 wheelers and trailers and trucks and all kinds of things, all lit up. They're the only lights there. And all of a sudden, these people along the road there get the idea that help is on the way. And so they get out there with their chainsaws and they start helping. They had to cut their way in seven or eight miles to Bass Memorial Academy. And they got there at three o'clock in the morning. And I still remember one of our students from Highland Academy was the girl's dean there. And she left a candle in the window. There was only three staff members left on campus. Everybody else had evacuated. She was one of them. The candle in the window. That's the only way they knew somebody was there. And so they went to that apartment, knocked on the door. We're here. Well, hallelujah, help is here. And I'm going to tell you, is help in a magnificent way. Some of those 18 wheelers have built in generators that they got the girls' dorm and the guys' dorm cranked up and they had power. And then they found out that they had a well that they were no longer using because they were on city water. Well, guess what? No power, no city water. So they connected to that pump, and the pump worked, so they now have water and power both. The only place around. And so Axe came in and started making a difference. They had a hundred young people there, two busloads, one from Andrews and one from Southern Adventist University. And when I got there, here you see individuals sleeping in the gym because, well, really, I wouldn't say that was a dry place. Luckily, if you probably don't know it, but it didn't rain for six weeks after Hurricane Katrina. What a blessing that was so that people didn't have all these problems to deal with along with more rain. But there's not a, a bit of tar paper up there. That all was torn off the gym. And you'll see a little bit of light there on the... The right side of your picture, that's because a third of the wall is gone. And so, all of those college students were bunked in there, and they were helping people. What you see here is called a pod, a point of distribution. Six counties of disaster-ridden individuals came there to receive food, water, ice, other necessities. 600 to 1,000 cars every day. Every day. Well, I got there a week after Hurricane Katrina had hit. And I was walking around seeing all this, and I finally said, who's in charge here? And they directed me to David Canther. And uh, that was... See if I can get back here. The individual on the lower left picture in the uh, maroon shirt, that's David Canther, and his partner there is Dale Bass. And they were the ones that were saying, where are we going to get our volunteers from? Well, I walked up at that very moment. It's kind of interesting how the Lord works things out. Because Southern already left, and... Andrews was leaving the next day. They had 14 people left after that. 
Well, there's going to be 600 to 1,000 cars coming the next day. And not only that, they had people they were feeding in remote kitchens. And they were out in the community helping people do things. And they were helping bass on campus. So they were utilizing 100 individuals with no problem at all. So I told him, I said, well, I've got you covered. I have 60 young people. We're going to come in. We're going to help bass for a week, and then we're going to get out of Dodge, basically is how I described it. And they said, that's great. Let us share with you what we're doing here. And I said, okay. And they began to tell me what they were doing and the process they were going through and that kind of thing. And they said, you know, if we had 100 young people a day, we could do a lot of work here. And I said, okay, I'm listening. And they began to talk more and more and uh, said, you know, if we had 160 young people a day. And I said, now, wait a second. If I bring you 160 young people here, you better have something for them to do. Because if you don't, young people find stuff to do. Because they want to be busy. They get bored. Am I right? Y'all want to be doing stuff. So he said, well, here's how I see it. We have 18 wheelers coming in every day that need to be unloaded, and the stuff needs to be gotten down here to be given away. We need probably 20 to 30 people there. We need 20 on the line here. We need people helping on campus. We need people helping in the remote kitchens. And we need people going out door to door in the community, seeing who needs help and what they need done. They can do something different every day. I said, I'm in. Didn't know what I was signing up for exactly. All I knew was that there was a need there, and God helped supply that need way beyond 60 young people. I called a school that night. They drove all night and got there the next day with a busload of young people to take over right as soon as Andrews left. It was incredible how things worked. My little cell phone worked when many other people's did not. Communication towers were down. Communication was sketchy, and yet my cell phone worked, and I got calls from Boston and Minnesota and California and Wisconsin, you name it. We had 1,200 young people come over five weeks. We averaged 152 a day. And every one of their lives were changed because of that. And I said, I'm in. This is what it's all about. And so you have this kind of thing going on. We were feeding people, and it's kind of interesting because when I drove up the Bass, believe it or not, there is a hill there in, in Mississippi. And uh, I was going up the little rise there, and I see a half a mile of traffic down the side of the road just sitting there. And I thought, what in the world's going on? This is what was going on. They were running the pod, and then when it came lunchtime, they had a big tent there. People would lock their cars, walk up, eat dinner, come back, get in their car, and wait their turn to get food and water and other supplies. Day after day, hour after hour. Imagine yourself coming home now. You live on the coast. And this is your home. You see the roof was torn off. And you try to get in the door and you can't. Because you find out that you have two feet of sand in every room of your house. How would you feel? Have you ever shoveled sand before? Have you ever put it in a wheelbarrow and tried to get it somewhere? It's heavy. Now imagine how you would feel if a busload of young people arrived and said, Can we help you? What would you say? Absolutely. Now, the interesting thing is, in about three and a half hours later, all of that sand was back on the beach where it belonged, and they were sweeping up the house. Now, how would you feel? That's when the questions come. Who are you people? Where are you from? Why do you do this? I mean, it makes no sense for young people out giving their time to do this kind of work. Those people's lives were changed. I can promise you by what young people did. 
If you've never worked in a disaster, you won't realize that you'll see miles of this. That's debris from people's yards. We'll go in there, the adults will run the chainsaws, and the young people will pull it to the curb. Called debris removal. The person's house might have been underwater, and so they could use some help. Now, another thing that comes to bear here is when we show up, many times people are really reticent to allow us to help them. You know why? Other people have already been there and said, do you need those trees taken out? And they'll go, yes, we do. Okay, we'll do that for you, uh, $10,000. And of course, many people don't have that kind of money. And now we show up. Uh, do you all need some help? Uh, I think we're pretty good. I mean, of course, you see debris all around the yard. You know their house has been underwater. Well, I'll tell you what. The Lord has blessed us. If we can bless you today, we're here to do that, and we don't charge for what we do. They think about it for a moment and say, okay, uh, we could use some help. So now all of a sudden we have 10, 15, 20 young people. How many are in that crew? And the adults are running the chainsaws, and they're hauling to the curb, and they become enthusiastic about what's going on here now. Wow. Well, you know, our house was underwater. If you could help us, we need to get our things out of our house because it's all destroyed. So not only do you see that, you see this going on all the time, too. Mile after mile of that. All of the people's personal effects go to the curb. All of those memories that they've had in their life goes to the curb to be hauled away as junk. So you have different piles. You have a pile for the debris. You have a pile for this kind of thing. You have a pile for appliances. Another pile for drywall. And if you don't put it in that order, they won't pick it up. So now you've created another problem for the person. If you just put it all together in one place, they have to sort it all through because the city will not pick it up. So you see all of these types of things going on. This is what a house looks like that had to have all of their drywall taken out. A husband and wife showed up. Their house had been between a river and a, an inlet. The storm surge was so high that it pushed water in, and their whole house was underwater to the ceiling. They came back home to find that mess. It took them two days to get the garage taken care of. And now you have the whole house left to do, plus the debris around it. Here comes our young people again. Can we help you? And you kind of go through that routine again. Well, you know, they're hesitant, but yes, we could use some help. It took a day and a half to get their yard cleaned up, all the drywall, including the ceiling, taken out of their house. But it took them two days to do just the garage. Those people were ecstatic. This little lady here, you can't see her because of the group hug, but she was in tears. She was despondent. She was it was almost more than she could handle. Her stepfather, well, her father-in-law, rather, had been put in the hospital. He was 90-some years old because of this event that took place. His home had been underwater. Her husband had been working so hard to try and deal with the situation that he had had a, a heart event, and so he was in the hospital, and she was left by herself. And then we show up to help. The unfortunate thing was, we could do some things for her. We got the debris to the curb. We got some of the contents to the curb, but we couldn't help her with the drywall and get into the house because it had been closed up. Do you know what happens when you close up a house that's been underwater? 
Mold and mildew, you can't work in there unless you have special equipment. You're just asking for some type of major health issue. And so we couldn't go in to help her, but we could give her encouragement. And these young people, when she was in tears, they just sort of got around her and gave her a group hug. All of that positive energy around her. And then we always pray with them. And we give them a hug and we say, we give them a steps to Christ along with that and say, here's why we do what we do. What are the chances of them reading that book, do you think? About 100%, don't you think? I know I'd want to find out about these people and why they do this kind of thing. And the steps to Christ is a pretty clear indicator of those kind of people that would do that. I want to just take a moment and share something with you about Waveland. Waveland was on the Mississippi coast. I don't know if you can see this line very well. Do you see down from the top this line there? You know what that is? Water line, a sediment line. The interesting thing about that is that's six miles inland. The water was that deep to that point, six miles inland. It came in with 145 mile an hour headwind. How anybody survived that, I do not know. But some did. And the stories that they had to tell about how they survived is incredible. And everybody had a story that stayed and they wanted to share it with someone. How they would be there in the trees with the snakes and the fire ants and the rats and the other things that are floating around trying to survive as well. If you don't know about fire ants, they ball up in one big ball and they kind of float and they look for some place to be. And if you happen to be that one, <laughs> if you've never had a fire ant sting, you don't know how to appreciate what I'm sharing with you. But they're extremely painful. While we were in Waveland, we had some individuals come to us, and I think they were officers of some sort, whether sheriff, police, I'm not sure. We had a couple of doctors with us, and they said, would you be willing to have some doctors and nurses go down to the prison? Well, when you say prison, automatically some bells go off in your mind and you're kind of thinking, well, I don't know about this one. Turns out, those that ran the prison just left them in jail. Those poor guys were literally having their faces pressed against the ceiling to have enough air to survive. And that storm lasted for hours. But this was a week after the storm was through. And they had been forgotten. Now in a storm like that, with that kind of water and that kind of surge going on, all kind of things are in that water. And not only that, just their own survival in that environment was horrific. They had no desire to hurt anybody. They were just wanting, needing help desperately. Those are the kind of things that go on in these situations here. We didn't send young people down there. We sent our doctors and nurses. But our young people were feeding people. We're going to their homes and helping them. People were literally living in their yards. They had no home. They had no place to go. They had no vehicle. And I don't know if that, yeah. This is a place where people always put their vehicles when there was a hurricane because it never flooded. Well, that was a mile inland. Guess what? The water was 20 feet deep, six miles inland. Those cars were useless. And we're talking about miles and miles, so it's not like a tornado where you can go down two blocks and go to Taco Bell and get a $3 meal. They could not walk out of there and get help. If it weren't for groups like ours that came in and brought them food and water, they would have died, no doubt. 
So this is the kind of situation that they were living in. And we were bringing them the actual things that they needed to survive. Food, water, even a shower. Imagine yourself, you've been through this storm and you survived somehow and it's been three weeks since you've had a shower. You've been living in your front yard. You have no change of clothes. It's all destroyed. There is no infrastructure there. No power, no water, no gas, nothing. The banks are destroyed. Walmart's destroyed. Everything's gone. These poor people were in horrific shape. As God would have it, this one school brought a sump pump. Sump pump is where you pump water from one place to another, okay? And somebody had given it to them. Last thing, they got it on their truck, and it was brand new. And so they get there to Bass, and they're saying, giving an inventory list to Dave Canther and saying, and we have this sump pump. And he goes, what would you say? Sump pump. He says, you see that group of guys over there? Yeah, they're praying for this pump. Can you imagine? You guys, two of you guys, pick up the pump, go over and set it down. Here's your pump. That's how the Lord takes care of business. But they were going, they did. They built showers out of plywood and tarps. And another interesting thing that I'll just share with you, clothes are a curse to a pod. And the reason I say that is we would get 18-wheeler loads of clothes and boxes and bags and no rhyme or reason to anything. So we had clothes 20 feet wide, 6 feet deep, and 100 feet long. You want clothes? Please, take it all. But you couldn't sort it. There's no way you could sort it fast enough to make any use out of it. But if they could find some things there, they could go into the shower, throw away their old clothes, get a shower, come out with new clothes on, how would you feel? You girls especially, how would a shower feel after three weeks and all that? Those are the kind of situations that God has allowed us to use young people to make a difference in people's lives. That house floated into the road and it had to be pushed out of the way. And just a few pictures to show you what it looked like mile after mile. This looks like it was hauled there, doesn't it? Well, it was, but it was hauled there by the storm. Those are people's homes. Those are businesses piled up in this probably 10 acres or more. It all just, as it was going out, settled right there. These homes were right across the beach, uh, right across the road from the beach. And if you were to go and look at the Gulf right now and you would say, how in the world could that body of water do all of this? But when a storm like that gets going, it does incredible damage, particularly with the water. Louisiana and Mississippi had 266,123 homes destroyed or majorly damaged. A little bit of perspective. That would be the same as wiping out Washington, D.C. That gives you a little bit of the magnitude of what happened there. We would go down and we would stay. This was a tent that we actually ended up staying on the coast. For a while we were driving an hour and a half each way, plus working all day, to help those poor people until we could find a place to stay. And there we would socialize, we'd worship, we would sleep. And here's a worship service going on. And we would have about a 15 or 20 minute worship planned. But at the end of two hours, we would finish with our testimonials of young people's lives who were changed that day by touching somebody else. Day after day, that happened. I don't know that we have time for a video, so I'm going to skip over that. You would like to hear it? Yes. Okay. I'll go back. 
Hopefully it'll come out. It's real low for a while, so let's see if it's cooperating. You'll be able to hear it. Well, it's, it's going to be real low here for a little bit. All right, so this is... Shall we try it one more time? Okay. Hopefully we won't get in too much trouble with those in charge. Is it playing? Oh, I'm doing this horribly, aren't I? I won't touch it anymore, I promise. It should be coming through your sound there. Okay, then I don't know how to do both of those because the sound normally goes through HDMI. You can just watch the pictures. This was a little town of Purlington that was pretty well destroyed and forgotten. But then you won't get the picture. That's what searchers would put on each house to say who had been there, how many bodies they found, that type of thing. This is in New Orleans. This is a back down at Waveland. Military presence was pretty much everywhere. This was the store right behind where we ran our pod. And these are items just left by the water. These individuals are stranded in New Orleans needing to be airlifted out or a boat to come get them. And so you can see how they had to get people out of their homes and this individual didn't make it amongst 1,800 others. They're repairing the levees down in New Orleans. And they're evacuating people now by the thousands. And there was such a overwhelming need, they wouldn't even land the helicopters. They would just push things out because they would be mobbed.
and there was all kind of altercations that took place during that as well. And this is where they actually would go home to home, and if there was a body there, they would have to remove it. And this was set up in Houston, where they were taking people as refugees from the storm. That little town of Purlington had beautiful oak trees like that that just destroyed their homes. Boats ended up in places where you would never expect them to be. And that was their attitude. Many people would rebuild there knowing that this could happen again. So it's pretty amazing what takes place in these situations. So Two Serve evolved from Hurricane Katrina. Two Serve came into its own in 20, well, actually the fall of 2015. Two Serve has a number of meetings. God sent us out how? Two by two. Never by themselves, two by two. And he asked us to serve. And when you go through CERT training, you're going to hear safety being first and foremost. And one of the ways that you have safety is by having a partner. So two, the number two and serve attached to it. Somebody hanging onto the cross, holding another individual as they reach down and help somebody up to serve. Why, what do we do in between disasters? What we're going to be doing here, actually. Just a little bit of an understanding of what that is. We do CERT training. Tri-City Christian Academy in North Carolina was our first location that we did our CERT training. And we would bring people in and we would set it up just like it would be a disaster. They would sleep on the floor, and that's also where we would do our training, where we'd do the eating, where we'd do our simulations, <laughs> where we would do our worship. To serve provides training and hands-on experience to schools in the eight components of the 20-hour course, and you'll hear this again, but for those of you that are not going to go through the training, again, CERT is Community Emergency Response Team Training. It involves disaster preparedness, how you yourself can be prepared, and your loved ones and your friends. Fire safety, mechanical op or medical operations, medical operations two, light search and rescue, CERT organization, how you work with others, such as the police, the fire, FEMA, in times of disaster. And disaster psychology, and we also say psychological and spiritual first aid. The two go hand in hand, do they not? And um, then terrorism is an issue that FEMA deals with. And by the way, this is a FEMA course, so you will be a CERT volunteer, a certified volunteer now with FEMA. And then the simulation, you saw some of what went on there, and those of you that will be involved with it will have your own simulation here. To serve provides experience in how to partner with multiple community agencies such as county emergency management services, law enforcement, EMTs, fire departments, schools, and so on. And I will just give you a brief overview. We did an active shooter drill at Forest Lake Academy where we had 80 first responders there practicing some things that they needed to do that they learned. This Forest Lake is in Orlando, Florida, as you know. And they had a shooting there where 50 individuals were killed. And they wanted to practice some things that they learned. And so they agreed that they would do that practice on Forest Lakes campus. And so we worked with all of those entities, including the FBI and the 9-11 operators and the fire departments and all of those who were there. 
it was quite an interesting thing. We also did um, some airport exercises where we provided the moulage. Moulage is where you make up people who look like they have injuries they do not have, but it makes it much more realistic. And so this was a dirty bomb explosion at the Orlando International Airport, and they were practicing. There was probably 10 firehouses there, police, uh, EMTs, SWAT teams, hazmat, you name it. This is what the inside of the plane looked like. And here they're getting prepared to do the moulage. And the moulage can be done very, very effectively. And by the way, these are high school students doing this. And so you can provide this with uh, others in your community here, if need be. So I have some others I'll go through quickly for you. That was an individual who was struck with lightning. Here you have a triage tag where you create on that person what they want you to have there. And different kind of things. So I will give you just an understanding. Heritage Academy was asked by Harvard University to come up and recreate the Boston bombing for their national or their international extreme medical conference. And they did that very kind of thing. And you have to be a good actors to make that realistic for those people coming in. So young people are doing these things. You folks are the ones that make this kind of thing happen. So why use young people? Because we're gonna finish the work in hard times, just like this says right here. What we fail to do in good times, we're going to be doing in terrible crisis. We can use young people and have proven that for the last 14 years to do an outstanding job in helping people under those circumstances. Matthew 24, in this gospel of the kingdom, will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations and what? And then the end will come. Not more storms, not more shootings, but sharing the gospel. When we were at Hurricane Michael last October, we touched tens of thousands of people. And they know about Jesus Christ now if they didn't before. So if, this, if you want to get it done, and so I want to tell those that are the administrators of this school, if you want to finish the work, it's doing what you're doing right here. Using young people. With such an army of workers as our youth rightly trained might furnish, how soon the message of a crucified, risen, and soon coming Savior might be carried to how much? The whole world. Young people will get it done. How soon might the end come, the end of suffering, sorrow, and sin? How many of you believe this is going to be happening very soon? Amen. We're all about helping young people, empowering young people to share the message that Jesus Christ might come back soon. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we're grateful that you have empowered us, and that you have called us, young and old, to touch others for you. I pray that your presence will rest here on this campus in a greater way than ever before, that the lives of these young people will be touched and changed and challenged to be a part of your work so that we can get off this planet soon. Bless and guide in all that happens the remainder of this night and this week that your will can be done here and that this training can be a blessing, we pray in your name. Amen.